In modern literature, one of the deepest and most basic metaphors for life is a river, which inexorably pushes travelers into the future, just as its waters push any boat in a single direction. A similarly basic metaphor in the pages of horror fiction is a haunted house. In this case, the haunted house being a literal structure, which represents the metaphorical structure of a traumatized or victimized mind, the mind of whatever phantasm haunts it. Now, in the 19th century, especially in the United States, a technology arose which produced a mythology that combined these two metaphors, the ghost train or the haunted train, basically a haunted house on a one-directional path. A powerful engine, laden with psychic anguish, literally haunted with the task of pushing travelers not only into the future, but into the netherworld, into the beyond, beyond death. There are rich cultural resonances with the ancient myth of Charon, the ferryman of death, as well as the modern Enlightenment era myth of the Flying Dutchman, the ghost ship the sight of which would doom any sailor. We're going to draw on some of these influences and more as we sketch out an adventure on a haunted train today. Welcome to PhD and D, everyone. I'm Dr. Bowers, and today we're going to talk about Sire 1313, the Morning Rail. This Ravenloft domain of dread is actually a haunted train bound from the campaign world of Eberron, but can travel anywhere. As with other Ravenloft videos, we're going to say a little bit about the domain, then describe a few cultural touchstones or influences which we can use to get an imaginative grip on the domain, and then we'll sketch out an adventure, in this case one which takes adventurers from levels 6 through 10. As I mentioned, Sire 1313, the Morning Rail, is indeed a haunted train. In this particular case, it comes from the Eberron nation of Sire, which was entirely destroyed in some kind of magical annihilation. The entire nation was destroyed, likely by magical weaponry in the course of a war. And the train, Sire 1313, was loaded with passengers who were trying to escape this fate. They could have made it out, but the train's progress was slowed by the need to wait for one passenger, the last passenger. And when this last passenger arrived, they were already too delayed in their departure. And so they succumbed to that atomic horror known as the morning, that wave of death which swept over the nation of Sire and left it a ghostly, irradiated wasteland. Still, despite the morning, the train chugs ahead, ceaselessly plunging through the shadow fell, through the dark, hoping to escape that which has already destroyed it. Keith Amon, author of the book and blog The Monsters Know What They're Doing, correctly described undead creatures as being driven by a compulsion. And I imagine that the compulsion of whatever drives Sire 1313, the ghost train, is the desire to escape, to go, to keep going faster and faster. And we're going to set an adventure on this thing. As for influences for this adventure, there are quite a few. I want to begin with the Super Nintendo game from 1994, Final Fantasy VI. In that game, there is an incredibly fun segment that takes place on a haunted ghost train. It's a train which ferries dead souls into the afterlife. Our pixelated protagonists find themselves accidentally aboard that train, and they must fight in order to get off. As they fight, they move from the rear of the train up to the forecarriage, and we're going to take this overall structure as a template for our own adventure. I also recommend the historical book Ghost Train by Tony Reeve. As its subtitle says, it covers a number of American Railroad ghost legends, including the funeral train of Abraham Lincoln and a few others. It's interesting, and if you want to ground the feel of your Sire 1313 campaign in some folklore, that's a good place to turn. I also recommend considering the character Blaine from Stephen King's books from the Dark Tower series, The Wastelands and The Beginning of Wizard in Glass. Blaine the Monorail is an evil train animated by artificial intelligence which over the years has gone insane, become depressed and suicidal, and utterly murderous and misanthropic. King's gunslinger protagonists must find a way to defeat the train and they cannot do it by force, they can only do it instead by an exchange of riddles. Blaine is a pain, and that is the truth, and he's also a fascinating antagonist to study when you're designing a Sire 1313 adventure. I also recommend the supplement Vermissian Ops for the game Heart the City Beneath by Grant Howitt and Christopher Taylor. Especially if you have a yen to make a whole campaign out of Sire 1313, and you're interested in the idea that there are different railway lines and different stopping points and different stations, this supplement can really provide a useful resource for designing that kind of longer-term Sire 1313 campaign. I also feel compelled to mention an upcoming board game by Weird Games called Vagrant Song. It's a board game about fighting ghosts on a haunted train, and it looks really fun. And I feel like it could provide an imaginative grip on Sire 1313. The next cultural influence I want to mention, however, I should mention with a degree of solemnity. 
I'm speaking of the animated series Goodbye Blue Sky from Pink Floyd The Wall. I think it came out in 1982. Ultimately, the horror which haunts Sire 1313 is the horror of war. It is a very real horror. It should be treated with sensitivity and profundity, and I feel that this particular cartoon is a powerful and deep and moving expression of that particular kind of horror. Completely on the opposite end of the emotional spectrum is episode 23 from season 7 of Star Trek The Next Generation called Emergence. This very strange episode of Star Trek could have easily been a ghost story. Our protagonists, all crew members on the Starship Enterprise, suddenly find themselves hostage to a group of ghostly creatures, only they're not ghosts, they're holograms, who have taken over the Enterprise and who are steering it under the false impression that they are on a train. They are lost in their own convictions and motivations and unable to face the facts and in many ways behave like ghosts. So I recommend taking a look at that as well. Finally, I'd like to mention Megan Caldwell's release on DM's Guild, which is just Sire 1313, The Morning Rail. It's a wonderful release on the Guild, which presents a full entry of Sire 1313 as if it were described in Van Richten's Guide to Ravenloft. It does not sketch out a complete adventure, but it does include a great number of creative and valuable adventure ideas. And for the record, the adventure that we're about to sketch out is not taken from this supplement, but it was inspired by a couple of its ideas. Now here's the background to our adventure. The Ghost Train Sire 1313 has, as its name would suggest, 13 cars. The PCs, whether bound from Eberron or some other campaign setting, are intending to board a train, and they board Sire 1313, not realizing what it is. As for why they're boarding the train, you can give them any quest hook. You're supposed to go to the place to do the thing. Here, go, take the train there. Point is, the adventure is on the train, not in the actual quest hook. Now, once the PCs realize that they are on a haunted train that sends them to the afterlife, they'll want to get out, and so they move from the second to last car at the back, car 2, all the way up to the 13th car at the very front, the forecarriage, in order to stop the train and get off. As they make their way forward and as they explore the train, they have the opportunity to encounter a number of clues. These clues reveal what actually happened during the morning, who was affected by it, what caused it, and who the last passenger is. If the PCs put these clues together and appropriately present them to the last passenger, they can defeat the last passenger without combat. This is a ghost story, and a ghost is ultimately a creature that cannot let go of something in life, either because there was an injustice that needs to be righted, or because there was a problem, or because of its inability to accept something. In this case, the last passenger cannot accept that the morning has already happened, that they did not escape, and that the train's journey out is hopeless. The PCs can lay the last passenger's spirit to rest by appropriately convincing him using the clues they find, or they can defeat him in combat. Either way, they level up from 6 to 10 as they pass through the train, and at the adventure's conclusion, they level up to 11 and leave. Now, for the sake of ease and utility, we're going to divide this adventure into 8 different parts. This is just because there are so many cars on the train. The PCs will only level up in parts 1, 2, 3, 4, and 8, however. In Act 1, the PCs board the train, find themselves on a passenger car, and realize where they are. In Act 2, the PCs either proceed backwards on the train to the luggage car, or they go forward into another passenger car and face someone who is collecting tickets. In Act 3, the PCs proceed to an observation car or lounge car which has panoramic windows, and through those windows they see the horror of the morning of Sire. They also have the opportunity to talk with some other ghosts, including the ghost of the last passenger's daughter. More clues abound, hostilities might ensue, and the PCs move forward another car. Act 4, or Part 4, occurs across a series of sleeper cars. Some of them have monsters or other dangerous encounters, but one of them has the diary of the last passenger, and it reveals some very horrifying truths. Act 5, or Part 5, is the medical car in which the PCs fight a gaggle of vampire spawn nurses, and perhaps find some medical supplies. Act 6 is the executive lounge, which is actually a safe place to rest. And Act 7 contains a confrontation at the very forecarriage with the last passenger and the engine of the train itself. As I mentioned, the adventure will take PCs from levels 6 to 10, and let's get started. As I mentioned, Act 1 begins with the PCs boarding the train. It's best to set this up so that the PCs intended to board a train, and that they just boarded this one instead. Once they board the train, they should immediately realize that something is amiss. There are a variety of clues to show that this train is in fact haunted. The interior of the train is aged and has an antique style. The calendars all show a very past date, the month of Olorun in the year 994YK. There could be a great figure from history known to be deceased amongst the passengers. 
And as for the passengers themselves, they're dressed in fine Victorian Eberron-style garb, but they are semi-translucent, cold, and they float an inch above the floor as they walk about the cabin. Speaking of which, the passengers will all vocalize their hopes that the train will depart soon. They all fear some impending disaster. As the ghostly passengers talk about this, PCs can make a perception check to notice the distant whine of sirens, like air raid sirens. In addition to these blatant clues, there's also the ability to detect undead and cast spells to that effect. And once the PCs realize that they are on a haunted train or a train full of undead creatures, the doors will lock and one of the passengers will exclaim, Do I hear a heartbeat? And the other passengers will perk up and say, Yes, I hear it too. A heartbeat. Oh, there's a heartbeat here. And all the passengers will start hunting for who among them is mortal. Of course, it's the PCs, and they need to act to do something. Maybe they cast the silence spell so no one can hear their heartbeats. Or maybe they just fly into a rage and kill all of these ghostly passengers. Use the statistics for specters in that case. Or maybe there's some other way the PCs think of to conceal the fact that they are alive. Regardless, there is no way out of the car until this is resolved. All the doors of the car and all of the windows are sealed with magical force. It cannot be dispelled, it cannot be counterspelled, it cannot be counteracted. They are trapped until they find a way either to deceive the ghostly passengers that they too are undead, or to defeat the ghostly passengers in combat. Either way, once they do, the doors unlock. And with that, the PCs level up to 7, and we proceed to Act 2, or Part 2, of our adventure. Now, in Act 1, the PCs boarded the second-to-last car of the train. So there's one car behind them and one car ahead of them, and the PCs face a decision. When the locks on the doors audibly open themselves with a click, the PCs can choose whether to go to the back or to the front. If the PCs move to the caboose, to the back car, they find it is a luggage car. It's full of animated luggage, floating suitcases, purses, and duffels. You can use the statistics for mimics or for spectators, and you could even have some mannequins back there, and they use the statistics for scarecrows. Put a bunch of low-level monsters there, which are easily and fittingly reskinned as animated luggage, and to reward the PC's efforts, put some treasure as well as a clue in this luggage card. For treasures, I would include something minor, like maybe a ring of spell storing with one slot, or an alchemy jug, or a cloak of protection, or if you wanted a more substantial reward, maybe a cape of the mountebank. In addition to the treasure, there's also a clue. The PCs find a fancy girl's dress in pristine condition with a card attached to it. The card says, To my beloved daughter, Isadora. This card and this dress, in fact, are presents from the last passenger to his daughter. And his daughter, Isadora, has a ghost which haunts another car of this train. Even if the PCs don't go into the luggage car, that is, even if they go forward as soon as they're allowed to, there are still plenty of clues. If and when the PCs go forward, they find another passenger car. As with the previous passenger car, there are people sitting in plush seats. They're all dressed in Victorian finery, appropriate to Eberron. They're chatting amongst themselves about whether it's going to leave soon, and they're afraid of the sirens, and they hope that it will. Now, these passengers all have the statistics of ghouls, but in addition, there is someone moving about the cabin with a more official-looking uniform and a flat-topped cap with a small brim, saying, Tickets, please. Tickets, please. Collecting tickets from the passengers. Now, if, in the previous car, the PCs fought all those specters to the death, they could have found tickets on the bodies of the specters, or on their ectoplasmic remains. If they did, they can offer these tickets to the ticket collector and avoid combat. Otherwise, there's combat. This ticket collector has the statistics of a Nosferatu. That's a CR8, and the PCs are level 7. But as Sly Flourish and others have pointed out, the Nosferatu does not actually hit very hard, other than its boiling blood breath attack, which recharges on a 5 or a 6. It should be a suitable boss monster for the PCs, in other words. If it looks like the fight is going too easily, you can always have some of the passengers stand up and add a couple of ghoul minions into the mix. Now, during the fight, the ticket collector is going to mention or mutter that the train is just about to leave. They just need the last passenger to come aboard. They're just waiting on the last passenger. And he'll say this in addition to vows to kick off any stowaways and that you have to have a ticket. This is another clue for the PCs to assemble in deciding what the narrative is or what happened on this train. Once the PCs deal with the ticket collector, they level up to 8 and move forward. Or at least, I assume they move forward. There's nowhere else to go, and I suppose, given the setting, it's kind of appropriate that this adventure is a railroad? <laughs> anyway, on to Act 3, or Part 3 of this adventure. The next car that the PCs enter is an observation car, or a lounge car, which has huge, wide, panoramic windows. And through these windows, the PCs can see something horrifying. The events of the morning. 
the atomic horror which devastated Sire. In flashes of light and magical fire, in the nightmarish wake of nuclear weaponry, the PCs can see people vaporized, castles melted, ground transformed, and undead monstrosities arise from the irradiated soil. These events play out over and over, from different angles. I immediately picture the bits of film footage that play behind Trent Reznor in the video for Hurt from the Downward Spiral, I think it came out in 1994. Just a ceaseless montage of the morning and its horrors that play through these windows. Now, in addition to that, this observation car has a small group of passengers, all ghostly, and they appear to be smoking, talking, and comforting a teenage girl. The little girl is a ghost, the ghost of Isadora, daughter of the last passenger, and the rest of the passengers, though looking like their counterparts, are going to have the statistics of gallows speakers. Describe how the one ghost of a young woman is very troubled, and the gallows speakers should be much more comfortable and much more leisurely. If the PCs try to speak to Isadora, the gallows speakers will prevent them. The gallows speakers will insist that the PCs sit down, play a few games of cards, maybe three games. The PCs, of course, could choose to attack the gallows speakers right there, or they could play the games of cards. There are three games, and to win, one of the PCs needs to roll a DC 16 Charisma Performance check. Now, if the gallows speakers lose all all three games, they become frustrated and they attack the PCs. But if they win all three games, they accuse the PCs of not playing and actually letting them win and attack too. The way to avoid combat is to have a mixture of wins and losses. Assuming the PCs either play that way or they kill the gallows speakers, they are then able to talk to the ghost of Isadora, the daughter of the last passenger on Sire 1313. And the ghost of Isadora reveals that she hopes the train leaves soon, her name is Isadora, and that the train is waiting for her father. She explains that her father is very important and he has something to do with the emergency, but she doesn't know what. As soon as the PCs get this information, there is another loud click as the locks of the doors of this car open. As the PCs proceed forward to the next car, they level up to nine. Act four, or part four, takes place across a series of four individual sleeper cars. One of these cars has the last passenger's diary. The rest have undead monsters or animated furniture. When the PCs find the diary, Isabella's ghost appears as soon as they pick it up. She says that she's afraid something awful is about to happen and that it's her father's fault, and then she vanishes. The diary, in turn, will be smeared, aged, and crumbling, but there is one legible passage. In that passage, the author claims that the time has come. He will take the necessary steps to end the war. He will do what is necessary. The history of next year will revile him, he says, but the history of next century will celebrate him. The war cannot go on. Something must be done to stop it, even if it means taking many lives, even if it means the end of the nation of Sire. The passage ends with some worries about the limitations of time, about how his plans allow for no margin of error, and he must get on the train at the exact moment, or else he too will be doomed, and his daughter. And by this point, the PC should begin to form a picture of what is going on here. History checks can help with this, but on that fateful day of Olorun in the year 994YK, the passenger had done something. Unleashed weapons, cast a spell, who knows what, but done something to destroy the nation of Seer. The last passenger caused the mourning. This was done with the motivation of ending some war that was going on, and despite being willing to murder countless innocent people, this guilty party, known only as the last passenger, wanted to save his daughter and himself, and was unable to. He boarded the train too late, and now he presides over the spiritual wreckage, forever trying to escape a magical destruction which he wrought and succumbed to. And when the PCs pass through the last of the four sleeper cars, they level up to 10, and we proceed to Act 5 of our adventure. Act 5 is rather simple. The PCs come across the medical car of the train. This medical car has a gaggle of vampire spawn nurses, as well as a clutch of healing potions. The next car up for Part 6, or Act 6, is the Executive Lounge. This is a place that was actually reserved for the last passenger, but the last passenger is not here. He's in the next car up, the engine room. In his absence, the PCs can actually take a rest in this Executive Lounge, even a long rest. And the PC should be level 10 when they move forward into the carriage, which includes both the engine as well as the last passenger. Now, I imagine the last passenger as being a shimmering, hologram-like creature with an indistinct, vague face and a shadowy body. When the PCs enter the fore carriage, he screams at them and assails them and accuses them of trying to disrupt something that is necessary. He rails about how important it is to escape before it's too late and how the entire nation is going to be burnt up if they don't go faster, faster, faster. 
And here the PCs face a choice. They can either choose to fight the last passenger, or they can try to use the clues that they found. Lay the spirit to rest by convincing him that he is already dead. It sounds corny, but this is how ghost stories go. A ghost is someone who cannot let go of what's past. I would not make it one single persuasion check or anything like that. I would have it be a series of checks so that you can draw out the encounter. And if the PCs actually convince the last passenger that he is dead, he will show remorse thank them, apologize for what he has done, and then confess that he is actually powerless to stop Sire 1313. The train is haunted in a way of its own, and it has a motive of its own. And as he explains this, a pair of necrocores will arise from the engine and attack. They are the motivating force, the animating force of the train. And if the PCs want to stop the train, they have to defeat them. This is the boss fight. Or, if the PCs chose to fight the last passenger, the boss fight is just one necrocore that animates the engine, and the last passenger himself, who has the statistics of a Zhang Shi. Given the challenge rating, this may be a difficult fight. But, as Matt Colville famously said, encounter design does not stop once you roll initiative. Maybe tone down some of the damage or some of the hit points, I don't know. Assuming the PCs prevail, all that's needed to do is actually stop the train using the control panel. It's just up ahead, and there are all kinds of checks that you could use to do this. Obviously, there's intelligence investigation to use to manipulate the panel, but the Barbarian could make a strength athletics check and just rip the whole thing up. Or maybe someone uses wisdom insight in order to detect what the motivation was for laying the buttons out just so. Regardless, once the PCs successfully interact with the panel and stop the train, they level up to 11, and they have a chance to finally escape. Every door and every window to the train is finally unlocked, they can leave, and as for where the train left them, well, that's up to you. Where's their next adventure going to take place? And that's our haunted train adventure for Ravenloft. That's our adventure for Sire 1313. What do you think? Do you think the adventure was too much of a railroad? How would you give more options to explore the train? Do you like the idea of confronting the last passenger? Or would you rather be influenced by, say, Final Fantasy VI or The Wastelands by Stephen King and have the player characters confront the train directly as an antagonist? Let me know in the comments. Thanks very much for watching, as always. Don't forget to do the internet things. Click like and subscribe. Don't forget to hit the bell icon if you want notifications about updates to this channel. Also, which other Ravenloft domains should I cover? I've been interested in Mordent and Valachan, but to tell you the truth, they're all really cool. I'm doing my best to release these quickly. Of course, it is near the end of the semester, and I'm an adjunct professor of philosophy at a couple of different institutions, and I've got all kinds of students that are emailing me, And but I will do my best to make sure that the next video goes up before long, and thanks very much for watching again. See you next time.